welcome. My gosh, what a wonderful large group. We didn't know if the weather would interrupt things, and um, we are so glad to have our new venue for both our programs and our board meetings. Um, they've been very welcoming here. Dan Meeks, back in the back, will wave. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Um, Dan's been uh, taking care of us here in the, in the new building, let us uh, know where everything is. So um, he is the media director for the um, Steeples Event Center. Wow, it's been a long time since we've been together. And we've, the board, the History Historical Society Board has been busy all during that time. Uh, we awarded our Doc Little Award in January at a board meeting because we didn't uh, have a program that month. And is Loretta here? Oh, of course you are. Loretta, if you could stand up. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds like most of you know Loretta and know the accolades that, um, that she carries around with her. She's very deserving of our Doc Little Award this year, so thanks for being here. Also, we've got some new board members um, that we want to introduce you to. If you're on the uh, Historical Society board, would you please stand? I'm turning my page so I'll get people's last names because we call each other by first names at the board meeting. Um, well, Carol, I can't find the list. Okay, so everybody knows Carol McNew, yeah? Still there. Um, Larry Lynn Scott's in the back. He's been on the board for a while. We have Pat Nelson standing up at our book table. Down in front, um, one of our new members is Rita Bruner. And Burl McCuller is back there. He's sitting down waving. And Sandra Hamrell. Thank you. Is Mary Chamberlain here? Okay. So Mary has taken on the duty of planning our programs. And um, I was hoping that she was going to be here in time uh, to introduce uh, her program. And um, considering that she's not, Kathleen will have to depend on me. Um, we will be passing the hat towards the end of the uh, presentation. We're all used to, to having that uh, happen, so that will continue. Um, in order to um, respect our subject title of our program today, the bar will be closed um, during the program. <laughs> um, so, Carol, have I missed any other news-worthy items? You think we're, okay, you think we're, we're good, we're good. So our presenter today, our program, is Kathleen Eaton. Kath <laughs> We've got a very generous audience today, don't we? <laughs> we do. Kathleen um, works at the um, uh, Royal Gorge History Museum. And um, as usual, we have Lisa and her um, photographer filming our programs. Um, Kathleen, I haven't met you that many times other than just recognizing you from the, from the museum. Um, it says here that you have a master's degree in public history from Royal Holloway University of London and an undergraduate degree in history and anthropology from Colorado State University. 
She's been working in the museums for the past seven years and is currently the education coordinator for the Royal Gorge Regional Museum and History Center, conducting school programs and historical presentations. So without any further ado, we'll go to your program. Wonderful. Thank well, you. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm glad everyone was able to come out today. Oh, yep, that's right. I'm so used to wearing it now. <laughs> All right. Well, I actually want to start this presentation with just kind of a question. I wonder if anyone here has ever heard someone refer to themselves as a beer snob or that they only drink craft beer. I'm kind of curious if anyone has heard that. <laughs> Maybe a few. So... <laughs> That's a quite common thing, I think, in Colorado, that people are very frequently consider themselves beer snobs. And it's kind of hard not to consider yourself one here in Colorado, because we actually have one of the highest per capita amounts of craft breweries. Now, that's kind of an interesting fact, because when you look at, at it historically, Colorado actually passed a prohibition law four years before the rest of the nation. That's not to say that worked in any way, shape, or form going to share this nice photo from 1907, very early one, to some uh, people at a saloon. And when the law passed, uh, there were so many loopholes, it's hard to say how effective it truly was. For one, the law allowed alcohol to be purchased for religious and medicinal purposes. Now, on, purpose, on paper, this sounds really good, but that also meant a lot of prescriptions went out that were less than necessary. And then there was also the loophole that allowed alcohol to be imported across state lines from wet states for personal use. The Wyoming-Colorado border was a very popular spot, just as it still is today for fireworks. <laughs> so the 18th Amendment was ratified January 16, 1919, and it went into effect January 17, 1920. After national prohibition went into effect, the Volstead Act, which carried out the intent of the 18th Amendment, permitted doctors to prescribe alcohol as a treatment to those who in good faith believe that the use of such liquor as a medicine by such person is necessary and will afford relief to him from some ailment. Suddenly, there were at least 30 maladies that could be treated by alcohol. One pint was to prescribe to those that met the very low requirements, and a prescription cost $3 to receive and 3 to $4 to fill. So that's around $38 today, accounting for inflation. Uh, just to fill a prescription of one pint of alcohol. So these people were very desperate. Uh, breweries suddenly had to come up with new ways to stay open. Coors in Golden became the world's largest supplier of malted milk. And it also invested in the pottery business and still produces products today. In fact, according to an article in Forbes in 2015, Coors Tech is the largest engineered ceramics manufacturer on the planet with sales of $1.25 billion. So that actually is a holdover from Prohibition. Mm -hmm. Can do. Yep, that's going to be Dan for volume. So we will hold, it, hold on to that for just a second. No, that's okay. We're good? Volume up a little bit? Everyone can hear now? Okay. So Colorado was officially dry on January 1st, 1916, but there were two men arrested that very morning for being drunk. That same year, it was estimated $3,000 to $5,000 worth of whiskey was brought over the Wyoming-Colorado border per month. Remember that little loophole I mentioned? One man even disguised whiskey as olive oil and salad dressing. Now, before you go trying that, he was caught. So many people in Colorado produced moonshine, and a local brew was named Sugar Moon because it was made with beet sugar, common in Colorado. One simply mixed 120 pounds of sugar, 50 gallons of spring water, and one and a half pounds of baker's yeast. It then sat for 10 days at a constant temperature of 80 degrees. Now, before you all go off and try to make your own Sugar Moon, if it's distilled improperly, it can lead to abdominal pain, anemia, hypertension, blindness, or even death. So don't go make your own sugar moon. So this also didn't stop people from searching alcohol out. The government, according to the Mob Museum, in hopes of keeping bootlegging from stealing industrial alcohol, 
instructed makers of the industrial use liquid to denature it by adding 4% wood alcohol, which is poisonous to humans in small amounts. So that didn't actually stop people. Uh, this actually just caused bootleggers to either learn how to distill it to make it to a drinkable level, or they just sold it anyway. So this disproportionately affected lower economy classes as they were the ones who couldn't afford the smuggled alcohol. And many blame the government and Dr. Nicholas Murray of Columbia University labeled it legalized murder. According to historian Michael Lerner, over 1,000 Americans died every year during prohibition. So the Ku Klux Klan favored prohibition because they could claim it was based around moral reform. Then, under this premise, they could commit violence against immigrants, African Americans, and those in poverty who were frequently targeted by the KKK, along with Jews and Catholics. Rather than all-out hate speech, the Klan set out to convince communities that immigrants and minorities were the cause of bootlegging and speakeasies, and the Klan could pick up the slack left by overworked and understaffed law enforcement. The raids conducted by the Klan members were hardly about seizing alcohol, unless it was possibly to drink it themselves, but rather a display of power and a way to instill fear. This was only further enforced by law enforcement who routinely targeted people of color, immigrants, and poor communities while leaving the wealthy Americans to drink in peace. So the Fremont County Daily News Klan edition on October 31st, 1924 listed what the Klan supported in Fremont County. Number 11 read as follows. We are pledged by the most sacred oaths to discourage and destroy crime in all its forms. This includes the violation of the 18th Amendment. We shall give loyal support to all officers who do their duty in enforcing the laws. We have no respect for any man, rich or poor, white or black, who deliberately breaks the law. And we have least respect of all for the man who buys liquor clandestinely and because of his prominence or wealth claims the right to use it as a member of a privileged class. The Klan believes in jail sentence for this sort of criminal as well for the unfortunate poor man. The Fremont County Daily News on August 26, 1924, also blatantly stated part of its purpose in Fremont County was specifically to help stamp out bootlegging in Fremont County. Illicit dealing in liquor has become common. Liquor laws were broken and treated with contempt. Public officials to whom citizens committed enforcement of the law notoriously aligned themselves with the bootleg gang. The Klan was organized with the avowed purpose of stamping out the liquor business in this county. It has given full and active support to the officers whose duty it is to enforce the provisions of the 18th Amendment and will continue to do so. So Fremont County has certainly had its complicated relationship with alcohol. So in 1906, Cary Nation visited Canyon City to speak about temperance. At the beginning, it did not appear to go to plan. She arrived in the city to find no preparations made for her to speak or her coming announced. She spoke instead at Leadville and returned to Canyon City the very next day. So in our collection, we do actually have a small hatchet pin with Carry A Nation inscribed on the handle. It seems feasible it may have won one of those sold after she spoke here. And there is certainly a chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, or the WCTU, here in Canyon City. Though it's hard to say how large it was, a 1904 paper reports that there was, it was not well attended, but the signatures on the Cary Hatchet Club quilt make up a decently hefty list. Now, it might be kind of hard to see on this image because it is far away, but all those red marks on it are signatures that are on this quilt. So all those signatures are making different designs. So by 1905, the city council was comprised of a majority against the saloons and interested in being a dry city and county. Passed in 1905, Canyon City ordinances listed that only licensed druggists could sell alcohol for medicinal purposes and no one else. The cost of a license in Canyon City was $6 per year. Many cities within Fremont County chose to go with a local option, meaning they could choose whether to be wet or dry. And this is just a family temperance pledge and a National Christian Temperance Union membership card. So despite the ordinance passing regarding the sale and distribution of intoxicating liquors, there were still those that continued to go on as before. Joe Walton was running a place named the Canyon City Labor Club. It was only for members, though it seems that membership bar was set pretty low, and he was selling alcohol. 
On July 1st, 1906, the club was raided by Marshal D.J. Houston and the Canyon City Board of Aldermen, basically city council. The group forced their way into the club at 610 Main Street, arrested Walton, and destroyed all the liquor. Unfortunately, that also was not all they destroyed. The partitions in the wine room at the rear of the business were chopped down, and the mirror behind the bar was broken, and beer glasses were thrown through the plate glass front. A crowd gathered during the destruction, and a group began to sing, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. In response, another group sang in opposition, Down, down where the Wurzburger flows. So after the destruction of the business, Walton fought back by charging the aldermen with malicious destruction of property. He also moved his business down to 312 Main Street. A petition was circulated around town asking that the laws regarding intoxicating liquor be enforced. Guards were stationed at the front and rear entrances of The Push, where Walton had moved and continued selling intoxicants. Articles don't indicate if he was arrested for a second time. So this is actually the Fultz building, which is no longer standing today. Um, and The Push can see, be seen on the right. So in that picture, that is where Walton moved down to. So in April 1907, the suit for damages was still ongoing, and Walton was seeking over $7,000 in damages. This entire time, his building had been locked and the keys in possession of the marshal, despite the building belonging to Henry Lloyd and Mrs. Anna Walton. You may have noticed that second name. She was the wife of the plaintiff. It appears the keys were finally handed back over in April. The case eventually gained statewide notice as the case was handed from the Fremont County Courts to the, Supreme, the State Supreme Court in 1912. So this all started in 1906. So in December 1912, the court concluded Walton was entitled to damages and the defendants, the aldermen, were required to pay those damages amounting to approximately $3,000. Walton is lucky though, his case was heard before 1916. Colorado became a dry state in 1916 and was likely not a major change for the residents of Canyon City, but while Colorado may have gone dry, that didn't mean everyone agreed. So Prospect Heights came into existence due primarily to alcohol. In 1905, Canyon City decided to go the local option and closed all liquor outlets. Local option refers to the ability of local political jurisdictions, typically counties or municipalities, to allow decisions on certain controversial issues based on popular vote within their borders. In practice, it usually relates to liquor or marijuana sales. The Dries gained control by enacting an ordinance prohibiting the sale of alcohol, and the saloons were forced to close. Into a group of enterprising citizens residing in South Canyon that were determined to have their own town. Thanks to the mines and smelter, the area around Prospect Heights had long flourished due to all the men hired to the companies. The Nonac No. 5 mine had opened in the 1880s, followed by the American Zinc Lead Company in 1891 and the Wolf Park Mine in 1895. While there was company housing available, not everyone lived in it. By 1906, the American Zinc Lead Company had become the United States Smelting Company. According to one report, the smelter had 200 to 250 men on its payroll. As the story goes, when Canyon City decided to go with a local option, those that lived in the Prospect Heights area realized the business that could be gained from the mines and smelter workers who still wanted to visit saloons and wet their whistle after a long day deep in the mines. In 1905, Anton and Florina Damick and John Music filed a town plat on April 10th, which consisted of 52 lots on just nine and a half acres. When the election was put forward, there were 57 votes for and none against. The town was officially incorporated on May 10th, 1905 as the town of Prospect Heights. For those in favor of prohibition residing in South Canyon or under its jurisdiction, this plan to become a town was not favorable. An article in the Canyon City Daily Record on April 20th, 1905 was titled, Why Not Call It Hell's Half Acre? and was unfavorable towards the property owners who were on the petition. To move forward with the petition, 30 legal voters who were property owners in the limits of the proposed city were required to sign. The paper, rather snidely, I might add, reported the object of incorporation is, of course, to prevent South Canyon from interfering with the saloons upon the hill. A town had jurisdiction over the territory within one mile of city limits where another incorporation does not exist. 
By incorporating the town of Prospect Heights, the people interested undoubtedly believe they may run saloons, dives, or anything else without interference from South Canyon or other authorities. On June 8, 1905, shortly after the town was incorporated, the Canyon City Times published another article regarding the recent incorporation of the town. Prospect Heights, the new town organized near the United States smelter, South Canyon, started out with a flourish of trumpets, so far as talk is concerned. But a look at the assessor's schedule does not inspire one with any degree of confidence in its necessity except that of possibly giving a few men the legal right to poison their fellow men, destroy families and homes, and turn loose upon the country the offspring of dissolute and vicious parents. The article continued its rant to say, its conception and birth is due to a feeling of spite and revenge, determination to get even on the part of a mighty few small caliber men. No, not men. No man would be guilty of hurling dissipation, hunger, and suffering into the faces of innocent women and children. Fortunately for Prospect Heights, the attitude of the surrounding area had no effect on their ability to incorporate. Soon after incorporation, alcohol began arriving on the train along the tracks bordering the town, and saloons appeared quickly and business began booming. But as with any place that has plenty of alcohol, tensions frequently ran high. On August 23, 1906, the Canyon City Times ran an article titled, One Man Dead, Result of a Drunken Row in the Saloon Town. According to the report, the marshal arrived at the saloon on account of a brawl. He was attacked by a man with a knife, and after attempting to defend himself and convince the men to stand down, he pulled his gun and shot the attacker. A jury determined Marshal Pilmore was justified in a shooting and subsequent death of the brawler. This wasn't the only death in the town, with many fights breaking out in the saloons. Many of the men appeared incapable of holding their liquor, and debauchery was common. It's no wonder many of the surrounding areas began to be fed up with the town and its copious saloons. A sheriff was elected in Prospect Heights, but where would he put everyone? So the Prospect Heights Jail was constructed in 1906 to help quell the rowdy patrons. Anyone who didn't want to go far to get their alcohol came to Prospect Heights including people from Canyon City and South Canyon. It was decided by the town trustees that the jail would be 10 feet tall and cost no more than $300. Each cell, of which there was to be two, was to be 10 feet, tall, was to be 10 feet long and 8 feet wide, with a wall between them 18 inches thick. There was also an office in place in the front of the building. Ernest Sell, a stonemason and bricklayer, is credited with the building of the jailhouse. As the story goes, he was also the first occupant of the finished jail. <laughs> After completing his work, he went down to the street to celebrate and partied a bit too hard, earning the dubious honor of being the first man to occupy the jail. We don't really find proof of this story, but it makes for a really good one. Another supposed resident of the jail was Tom Mix. Mix is well remembered, though not always for his acting, with a Selig Polyscope company who filmed in Canyon City. His third wife, Olive, was part of the Selig Company as well, and stories of her chasing him down when she knew he was going to drink and cavort around town were well known. One story tells of him running into the Elks Club when she came looking for him and hiding on the awning after going through a window. Olive, knowing he was in the building, was standing guard at the door. Mix was unceremoniously dumped at her feet when another unsuspecting staff member unrolled the awning. Other stories of Mix took place in bars, with other actors and locals taking turns shooting lemons off shot glasses at the end of the bar and betting to see who would pay for the drinks. When the bar, possibly the Colorado or McGovern Saloon, was torn down, bullet holes were found in the wall corroborating the story. One night, as the story goes, after too many drinks, Mix began shooting erratically in a bar. He was placed in the jail and had to be bailed out by the producer when he didn't appear on set the next morning. So the jail was last used in 1914, when U.S. troops were called into the area due to the coal strike. The town could not afford a jailer or marshal, so the jail was no longer used. Despite this, the town continued to take care of the jail, so it didn't fall into disrepair. Unfortunately, at some point in time, the key was actually lost. They must have found it, or changed the lock, because in 1988, the jail was turned over to the Historical Society. In 2003, the jail was added to the Colorado State Register of Historic Places. Today, the jail exists as a historical landmark and is open over the summers to the public. 
So the glory of Prospect Heights as a saloon town was short-lived. In 1909, under a ruling from the Supreme Court, Prospect Heights was told to close its saloons. Despite being its own town, Prospect Heights still fell under the jurisdiction of a precinct. So when that precinct voted in favor of being dry, Prospect Heights was required to end all sale of liquor. Aware of this possibility, the residents had circulated a petition in August 1907 that asked the city to be separated from South Canyon and placed in its own voting district. Once again, South Canyon did not agree and saw no excuse for it to happen. It appears it did not, as Prospect Heights was still part of the precincts in 1909. But just because they were told to stop selling alcohol doesn't mean they complied in a snappy fashion. In the Canyon City Times on July 29, 1909, the writer complained about the lack of action by the district attorney in closing the saloons in Prospect Heights. The writer felt the DA was not doing his duty in closing the saloons, and it was hurting the county as a whole. Of course, when he finally did go to close the saloons, people still weren't happy because he gave them a week's time to clear out their stock. A Canyon City Times posted on September 26, 1909 regarding their discontent once again. A week's notice to cease violating the law. What do you think of that law-abiding and respectable citizen? A week's time to sell off their death-dealing poison. A week's time to ruin some young man, if possible. A week's time to harbor tramps and thieves to rob houses on the south side and make life miserable for the people over there. I'm starting to get the impression the Canyon City Times was not appreciative of alcohol. The article continued to say, not only will the saloon cease to disgrace the community, but you will have no more Prospect Heights, for it will cease as an incorporated town. The only object of its incorporation was to enable them to have saloons over there, and now as that privilege is taken away, the town will cease to exist as a corporate entity or separate town. Now, I can tell you that was very incorrect. For one, Prospect Heights didn't actually stop selling alcohol. It wasn't the only place in the county that didn't follow the law, but it, but it had a kind of closer eye on it. And we had plenty of rum runners and moonshiners aplenty, but people were keeping a close eye on Pro uh, Prospect Heights. So in January 1910, Tony Adamic's saloon was raided, and his bartender, John Snadjar, was caught in the act of selling alcohol. This photo does not deal with that, but it just kind of shows a still raid. This one is actually in Denver in 1927. So in August of that same year, John Snyder, John Adamic, John Uvick, John Kimmick, and Peter Plesser were all arrested for selling intoxicating liquors. The sentencing of the men was published in the paper in September 1910. Kimmick was put in the county jail for 60 days as one of the principal bootleggers in the locality. Snadjar was fined $500 and a 90 days in jail, and was the first bootlegger convicted. Joe and Matt Uvick were both sentenced, Joe with 30 days and a $100 fine, and Matt with 30 days. But the judge suspended the sentence under the assurance they would conduct themselves as good citizens. It was decided the men had been induced to deal in beer without realizing the enormity of their offense. Even the mayor was actually not immune. Mayor Lewis Pierce had, warn had a warrant placed for his arrest, as reported in the Canyon City Record, in August 1910. He was accused of selling alcohol in a dry territory, and he managed to get away during the raid, but his wife was told by authorities that she would be taken into custody in his steed if he did not surrender himself in 24 hours. He did show up, and his wife, if he did, if he did not show up, his wife was to be charged unless he voluntarily turned himself in. He finally did show up in October, and he turned himself over to the authorities and was charged and his wife was also charged as he was gone for a few weeks. Now, the law stated at this time you could not sell or purchase intoxicating liquors, not that you couldn't drink them. An article in the Canyon City Times in July 1911 made note of this little loophole. It's titled, Sheriff's Office Makes Raid, a gang from Prospect Heights in the Toils Again. Saturday night, about 12 o'clock, Sheriff Esser, together with C.F. Skinner, D.J. Houston, Hiram Pillmore, George Paget, Jerry Moran, and H. L. White made a raid on the dispensers of booze at Prospect Heights and landed four of the violators and brought with them enough beer and whiskey to last a fishing party at least a week if they did not drink too much. Mr. Frank Bartell, bookkeeper in the sheriff's office, is planning a fishing party to take care of the surplus as it takes up too much room. 
Pretty comforting thought about our sheriff's department in 1911. The newspapers are not short on raids that took place at Prospect Heights. The Canyon City Record on February 1st, 1912 reports that joints in Prospect Heights had been raided. In one of the joints, five kegs of beer were found, along with some whiskey and other intoxicants. One of the men was fined $150 and 10 days in jail, while the other had yet to have a hearing at the time of the article. On July 11, 1912, it was reported a raid had been conducted on a house across from Prospect Heights store and found Matt Chanick passing out beer from four barrels. Chanick's defense was to claim he had the beer in his house for his baby, and he was not selling it. Again, he claimed four barrels of beer were for his baby. As expected, that excuse did not work on the two sheriffs. According to the article, many families selling beer in Prospect Heights had a system that helped them avoid detection by authorities. Different families took turns selling what was referred to as Dutch oil. One family would sell it one day, then transfer the goods to another family who would sell it for one day, and so on. It was thought that with the prosecution of Chanick, the selling of liquor would stop. So by 1916, Colorado had enacted statewide prohibition, and by 1920, it was national. This made the crime of selling and buying alcohol an even greater offense. It certainly didn't stop people, just made the punishment more expensive. In 1920, A.P. Rutliff, a notorious bootlegger in southern Colorado, was arrested. He was at the corner of Main and 8th Streets at the garage of Canyon Auto Company. He pled guilty to a charge of carrying on an illicit traffic in intoxicating liquors. This led to a fine totaling $145.50, which would equal around $2,000 today when accounting for inflation. He had likely been running a still for over a year, meaning he was a bootlegger before it was cool, at least by nationwide standards. So by 1925, the state enacted a law that the operation or possession of a still was a felony and carried a sentence in the penitentiary for up to two to five years. Canyon City was headquarters for a still hunter who worked in cooperation with the sheriff. So just another illegal whiskey still. This one, unfortunately, I do not know the location or the year. A sheriff was a, uh, still was an apparatus used to ferment a mash from corn, sugar, or fruit, beets, even potato peels to produce alcohol. Still, it could often be hard to find, making it hard for some accusations to stick. But that doesn't mean you might actually not stumble across one. Take the case of a couple from Fremont County in 1925 who found their home had been turned into a whiskey distillery without their knowledge. Mr. and Mrs. Elmer Ahart had closed up their summer home in Nesterville for the winter months. Mr. Mrs. Ahart returned to the home in May to pick up some things and instead found a distillery with barrels of alcohol. Now, quite a surprise to find your parlor full of whiskey. I imagine many would have actually taken the chance to throw a party, but Mrs. Ahart con contacted the police. At the time of the article, they had no leads on the suspects, which is not overly unusual. Another still was encountered in Garden Park by Eric Freak in 1926. This time it wasn't in a home, but actually a cave. The still had been in operation a few days earlier, according to the article, and two 50-gallon barrels were found filled with mash. The sheriff was contacted, and he, along with his undersheriff, went to the area to stake it out. It was concluded 20 to 30 gallons of whiskey had been made there during the last few months. Despite the efforts of the sheriff, the owner was not found. Now, there was other people actually found with their stills, such as the case of A.C. Compton, who lived west of Florence. He disguised his still to look like a gas burner with a small pipe running from it to dispense alcohol. He hosted a 4th of July party, which attracted the attention of prohibition officers. So if you have an illegal still, maybe don't throw a party. After searching the house, an officer noticed something odd about the stove. When they turned a piece of the stove, whiskey ran out instead of gas. Compton was, of course, charged with unlawful possession of liquor. A 15-gallon still was confiscated in Lincoln Park in 1920 by two revenue men, despite no alcohol being found on the premises. Tony Castellia was a boarder at the home of Mrs. Canellia, who had three months prior to the raid been fined for selling alcohol. It took the men quite the search to find the still, which was finally discovered in a chicken shed covered with clothing and old rags. 
The pipes were found under Castellia's bed. No liquor was found on the premises, so the man was charged with hoarding before he was turned over to the local authorities, where he was charged with owning a still and producing liquor. He was fined $100 in costs of the arraignment. It was thought that Castellia was making white mule, which is a type of moonshine. In May, another man was arrested in Rockville after being suspected of bootlegging white meal. Joe Goglio was fined $100 and served 30 days in the county jail. He had been found with a bottle of white mule, 40 gallons of mash for making beer, 100 quart bottles of alleged wine, and about 15 gallons of raisin wine. He was also found to be in possession of a still. Fortunately for him, the official records of his arrest in Florence for a traffic of liquor were not preserved, so he couldn't legally be given a stint in the penitentiary. Now, it wasn't just your run-of-the-mill local residents that were being caught breaking the law. District Attorney T. Lee Witcher arrested and filed charges against people who were running the city and county. The county attorney, Augustus Peace, and former city manager, Charles F. Skinner, both had charges of violation of the prohibition law in the unlawful possession of intoxicating liquor against them. In Skinner's case, officers found several gallons of liquor in his home, including one he'd concealed in an old stove. Tony and Charles Sarladino and Frank Poundy were also arrested in 1928 in the rear of the Sarladino soft drink parlor for being caught with alcohol in Williamsburg. They were keeping it in an outhouse. <laughs> so they would sell it to those who wanted maybe a little bit more than soda. Both Tony and Frank went out to get a court and were arrested by the hidden cops. Charles came out next and walked over to the liquor but did not touch it, possibly suspecting something was wrong. He was arrested anyway. Gus also came out, but not arrested as he did not implicate himself, perhaps realizing something was wrong when all his friends never came back. So prohibition, prohibition led to some interesting side effects. Crime increased significantly, I might add, when the goal of prohibition was actually to decrease crime. And that crime increase led to an increase of those incarcerated in the prisons. Many of the people in the prison were in for general liquor violations. In 1925, the paper reported 18 prisoners were in the county jail serving time for violation of the state prohibition law. One man was arrested for a single pint of alcohol in his possession. In 1932, the new governor considered amnesty for prisoners in liquor violations. There were 104 men in for prohibition offenses, contributing to prison overcrowding, according to Warden Roy Best. It is not stated if the men were released early. As the government began to move towards a repeal of prohibition, it was estimated up to 10% of the prison population would be decreased. Prohibition essentially made criminals out of ordinary citizens. So prohibition was finally repealed in 1933, and Colorado became a wet state again after 17 years. In fact, Colorado repealed all local temperance ordinances months before nationwide repeal of prohibition was enacted. Prior to that, 3-2 beer had been allowed to be brewed in the early part of 1933. Many of the people who had originally voted for prohibition were the strongest supporters in repealing it after seeing it didn't create the change they hoped to see, including John D. Rockefeller. When the economy crashed in 1929, people also argued that a repeal of prohibition would mean jobs, business expansion, and tax revenue. From one of the states that helped pave the way for prohibition to one of the states that helped prohibition be repealed, Colorado had its shifts with, in its relationship with alcohol. Colorado had its own rise in organized crime, including Sam and Pete Carlino out of Pueblo. There was also a burden on the judicial system as cases were backlogged due to their sheer number. In 1926, Colorado became the first state to hold a referendum calling for repeal of the 18th Amendment, which didn't actually pass but another repeal in 1932 did pass with 67% of the vote. Starting April 7, 1933, beer with a maximum alcohol content of 3.2% by volume could be legally sold in the state, though federal prohibition was still in effect nationwide. This loophole meant that beer could be bought and sold in Colorado, but it was illegal to travel with or ship it across state lines. And Fremont County? Well, that was a whole other story. Canyon City voted to stay dry in 1933, but the rest of the county voted for repeal, and so that ended prohibition here. 
So the very first person to receive their new license and call in Canyon City was George P. Nix, proprietor of Coffee John's Cafe. It was $80 for his license, which is quite a bit, which he paid April 7, 1933. This was the day that 3-2 beer was once again legalized in Colorado. Accounting for inflation, that license actually cost $1,582. In 2011, a retail liquor license cost $227.50, not including the additional fee for the city of residence. So nationwide, prohibition failed in many of the ways it was supposed to improve life. It was thought by the preventing people from the purchase of alcohol, sales on other goods and services would go up. Sales of clothing and household goods were expected to go up, and real estate developers and landlords expected rent to increase as saloons closed and neighborhoods improved. Theaters expected higher attendees as people looked for entertainment that they could no longer get in saloons. This was not the case. Spending did not increase on other goods, and many restaurants had to close their doors once they lost business without a liquor license. Theaters lost attendance in the early part of the decade with a decline in nightlife. And losing the revenue gained from the liquor tax was also a huge hit. The closing of breweries, distilleries, and saloons eliminated thousands of jobs, which meant even more jobs were eliminated in related trades, such as barrel makers and truckers. Organized crime also increased since running booze was a lucrative business. Prohibition provided crime families with something to give a large majority of the public, alcohol. The mob profited and the public took the risk. Often the alcohol run by bootleggers was toxic since there was no regulation. Side effects could include blindness, paralysis, and death. However, profits became so large that organized crime became even more organized. They had lawyers, accountants, truckers, warehousemen, and brewers. However, mob violence increased, and as the gangs clashed, which contributed to people petitioning for a repeal of prohibition. Corruption among public officials was also rampant. While there were likely many public officials who didn't fall prey to bribes, there were many who did. According to the Mob Museum, the pay of a prohibition agent was low, leading to many accepting bribes from cash-ready bootleggers. Some had direct ties to bootleggers or were bootleggers themselves. Local police would also take bribes from bootleggers to look the other way or tip them off when a raid was planned. By 1930, the Bureau of Prohibition moved from the Department of the Treasury to the Department of Justice had 1,587 out of 17,816 prohibition employees fired for things such as lying on applications to perjury, robbery, bribery, embezzlement, and contempt of court. Now, there is actually a benefit to prohibition. Women were actually allowed to be active politically. Women were encouraged to be politically active, but campaigning for prohibition was considered more acceptable, possibly because it dealt with improving family life and therefore more the women's sphere. Since the temperance movement, largely run by women, helped pass prohibition, this meant women were allowed a taste of the political process and helped achieve women's suffrage. Speakeasies were also available to both men and women, whereas many bars had previously been catered only to men. This allowed a greater inclusion of women into a realm that was previously only held by men. During Prohibition, churches, pharmacies, and hospitals all increased their purchase of alcohol. Churches were still allowed to purchase wine for religious reasons, pharmacies suddenly gave out more prescriptions, and hospitals suddenly needed alcohol for medicinal purposes, increased significantly. They all found the loopholes and they ran with it. So during Prohibition, church, oh, sorry. So the law that, designed, that was designed to stop people from drinking instead turned them into experts on making alcohol and acquiring alcohol. Home stills, or at least the parts that could be, per, or at least the parts could be purchased at hardware stores. Instructions for distilling could be found in public libraries in pamphlets published by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Instructions could also be found on the backs of wine bricks in the form of a warning. U.S. law said grapes could be grown if they were used for non-alcoholic consumption. 
if the grape grower gave a clear warning that the grapes were not to be used for the creation of alcohol, the grower could not get in trouble if the brick was used for alcohol. Wine bricks of concentrated grape juice had warnings not to leave in a cool place for 21 days or it would ferment. Obviously, knowing people were buying this for winemaking, these companies even marked the bricks under what flavor it would be should it mistakenly be left to ferment. <laughs> under the Volstead Act, the head of a family who has properly registered may make 200 gallons of wine exclusively for family use without payment of tax thereon. According to the Mob Museum, this meant families could generate but not sell or transport the equivalent of 1,000 bottles of wine a year. That is 2.7 bottles per day for home consumption. And they didn't have to pay taxes on it. So that seems like quite a bit of wine for a country that's actually prohibiting alcohol. Alcohol could also be procured from other countries. The Canadian border was popular, as was the Mexican border. Rum runners would take their boats to the edges of states bordered by water and sell their alcohol. Even European countries would ship alcohol overseas to give the American people what they wanted. So the very law meant to foster temperance instead, made many drinking, instead began making many drink to excess. When people went to a speakeasy or joint, they frequently drank quickly and in large amounts. And making alcohol legal did not prevent people from suffering from alcoholism or acquiring alcohol if desired. However, it did actually hurt those people as many, as many of these places designed to help alcoholics actually closed down. And AA, uh, AA started in 1935. So at least three deaths in Fremont County can be attributed to alcoholism during Prohibition. Now I know you can't really see these, but it's just to give an idea of what a coroner's inquest looks like. These are actually from our collection at the museum. And so there are likely others, but only three were actually listed in the coroner's inquests. So other deaths attributed to alcoholism are listed in the inquest, but took place prior to 1916 when prohibition became implemented statewide. Erwin Augustine died February 4th, 1923 in Hillside with his death attributed to chronic alcoholism. A neighbor furnished the information that stated Augustine had been drinking heavily the past few days and the day prior to his death. Henry R. Corning died of cirrhosis, scarring on the liver, preventing it from functioning properly, on March 14, 1923 in Florence. The coroner's inquest of John Tafoya specifically says he had been drinking heavily of bad liquor for a week or more. So this specification may have meant he was drinking alcohol that was distilled incorrectly, leading to a batch that was potentially deadly. He passed away in Florence in March 1923. So there is one last fact about bootlegging I would like to end on. You can thank Prohibition for NASCAR. Bootleggers couldn't outrun the police, so they began to modify their cars. The cars looked ordinary on the outside, but had modified engines, removed floorboards and seats, and added suspension springs so cases of booze could be handled while the cars drove much faster than those owned by the law. Drivers often had to outrun the police and drive on roads that were not in the best conditions. The drivers also had to be skilled at driving as they often drove at night on dirt roads with no headlights. Runners used the best tires available as a bad tire could lead to arrest and a hefty fine. Now, ironically enough, the Ford V8 introduced near the end of Prohibition was the car of choice for bootlegging, a fact that Henry Ford, a devout teetotaler, must have despised. <laughs> So he built this car and people were using it for bootlegging. Many bootleggers continued to run after prohibition ended as they didn't want to pay the federal taxes. In 1936, Daytona held the first organized stock car race as a promotion. It actually lost money, but Bill France, the fifth place winner and prohibition era mechanic, was determined to find a way to organize stock car racing. The first NASCAR race was held in Daytona, Florida on February 15, 1948. Many of the drivers, including the winner, Red Byron, had started out as former moonshiners and rum runners. So I'm going to open it up to questions now. And I believe as I'm doing questions, they're going to be passing the hat around if you would like to donate. So does anyone have any questions about prohibition? Sir, has there anyone here? I'm Edward Adamic. 
a third generation Adamic only. Does any, has anyone here ever heard of the fact or the knowledge that the industrial age, the combustion, internal combustion engine and energy cycle was first designed with alcohol, but then, as time went on, became gasoline. That prohibition had something to do with the gasoline age. Does anyone here have any information about that? Good. <laughs> Can you contribute? I'm glad someone knows something about engines, because I do not. <laughs> Are there any other questions? So this is a picture from our collection. We didn't have any good 1920s photos, so I decided this was my good ending photo. Um, this is labeled as post-puberty prom queen. I do not know the bar it is in. Um, but I believe it's 1963 is what the tag has. <laughs> but I thought it was a good one because it's in a bar. And she looks like she, uh, you know, is asking for questions, so. <laughs> I'm sorry? So the Carlino brothers, I know that they were out of Pueblo when they first started, um, and they largely began uh, kind of their crime family due to prohibition. They actually ended up moving up to Denver, and um, I actually listed some notes for myself just in case someone asked about it. So um, they originally lived in Walsenburg, and then they moved to Pueblo and controlled the liquor sales there. By 1930, they actually had bought a home in Denver, and in 1931, um, Sam was actually shot and killed in his living room, and then Pete was actually found dead outside Pueblo on Salome Road. So they, by 1930, were already operating mostly in Denver. Um, so it's possible that when they were in Pueblo, they did run some alcohol here in Canyon City and Fremont County area, but we don't have any news articles that specifically points to them running anything here. But being so close, it really would not surprise me. Uh, what family name was that? Carlino. Merlino? Carlino. Uh, C-A-R-L-I-N-O. And Loretta has a question. 
Well, Kathleen, it's obvious you did a, a lot of research. So uh, coming across some of the terminology at that time that they would use to uh, let know that, uh, like the bootlegger who would come to the dance halls and, and go around and around it, uh, advertising, uh, and his boot was full of liquor. <laughs> so did you come across a, uh, any of that side of it? Um, you know, I didn't come across anything about the origin of bootlegger, but if that's the case, that would make a really good story. <laughs> Um, but no, I did not come across anything about the specific origin of bootlegger. I guess, I think it's something just, I guess I didn't even think about just because it's such a common term, you know, just for prohibition. Well, maybe some of your audience might uh, know some of the terms that was familiar here in Canyon City uh, about well, and I'm getting also it. I'm also happy to, uh, that after this program, I can go look that up, and then next week we can post on our Facebook about the etymology of bootlegging. If people are interested, I'll go look that up. <laughs> All right. Well, unless we have any more questions, uh, I think we will wrap this up. Uh, do you want to have any last words, Gloria? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. This was a good um, practice for us for this large of a venue. Um, so we will continue to work on um, how that, that sounds in the future. Kathleen, you're obviously very knowledgeable and do, um, did a lot of homework on this. So we're very pleased to um, offer you a little gratuity. Thank you. And um, are you available to to um, answer any other questions as people get ready to leave? Yes, I am more than happy to hang out here. I've, if anyone does have any questions, I have a couple notes for myself as well about prohibition if people have questions about that. There is still some states that do have prohibition in effect today. Um, so if anyone has any questions about which states maybe you can't go buy alcohol in, I can answer that. And I want to say thank you all for coming and I hope you had fun and I like sharing about prohibition. I think it's a fascinating topic. So thank you all for coming. Thank you.